you guys doing this morning? Good. 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 It's awesome to be back here in Knoxville. Amen. If you don't know me, uh, my name is Jake. I've lived here for 15 years. But I kind of disappeared to South Africa for a while. I've been there for a year. And uh, so it's awesome to be back and to speak to my home family. And uh, I'm excited to dig into the word of God with you guys. You guys ready? Yeah. Turn over to First Timothy. That's what we're going to do. Who knows who Sidney McLaughlin is? Okay, we got a few people that know who Sidney McLaughlin is. No. And, but if you don't know, I'm going to tell you who she is, okay? So she's a disciple in, in our family of churches. I'll just say that, and I'll leave that for later. But in October of 2019, someone named Delilah Muhammad set the world record for the women's 400-meter hurdle at 52 seconds, 52.16 seconds. That was 2019. However, Sydney McLaughlin broke that world record for the 400-meter hurdle uh, in 2019 later that year by 0.26 seconds and became the world record holder. But then in August of 2021, she broke her own world record that she just set by another 0.44 seconds. And then just yesterday yes. in Eugene, Oregon, she broke her own world record again by 0.73 seconds. So she not only holds the new world record, but the top four fastest times in the world for the women's 400 meter hurdle. And she beat out the previous world record holder by 1.48 seconds total. And, you know, so obviously we're very proud because she's a disciple in our movement. And we go, oh, she's a disciple. I'm excited for her. And uh, I watched it yesterday, not live, but I heard people on Facebook talking about it. So I wanted to see it. And it was, she beat everyone else so badly. She was actually at one point out of the camera frame because the camera was trying to watch everyone. And she just, she just slept and had to adjust. That's how fast she was going. When, uh, after she won, the commentators were going crazy. Two of them were having a conversation. They were saying, what are we witnessing here? And the other commentator said, absolute greatness. And uh, when she gets up to her interview, by the way, she's 22 years old. So she's very young in her career. She gets up at 22 years old, a world record holder four times, and she gives glory to the God that we worship. She quotes scripture saying the scripture has been on my mind all week. And then she proceeds to the interview. And I think that's why we're really proud of someone like that. Someone as a disciple that we know who's in our movement. And so we kind of feel, you know, some level of relation. No, they have the same Holy Spirit I have. And they're out there speaking about how great God is. And we get all excited about it. And she has a platform that we don't have access to. She can speak to thousands, millions of people that we can't speak to because of the platform she has. And I think that's why we get so excited. But the same message that she talks about in front of millions of people is the exact same message that you have to give to other people. She's not speaking anything different than what you already have access to as well. And so it's awesome to be excited for her and to encourage her and to share about who she is. But you also have the exact same message she's speaking about. So you can be excited for yourself that you can spread the message, right? Amen. So today we're not going to talk necessarily about the message, but we're going to talk about how God feels about those who have not heard the message. Let's go to 1 Timothy chapter 2. And we're going to use these two scriptures as like a baseline what we're going to talk about for the rest uh, of the day, I guess. So 1 Timothy 2 in chapter 4, or I'll start in verse 3. It says, this is good and pleases God our Savior, who wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. Let's turn to 2 Peter chapter 3 as well. So we know God wants all people to be saved. And in 2 Peter chapter 3, in verse 8, it says, But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promises, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. So who does God want to be saved? Everybody. Everybody. Who does God want to perish? Nobody. Nobody. Who does God want to come to repentance? Everybody. Everybody. There is not a soul or a person or a beating heart on this planet that God does not want to reach out to with his message of salvation. 
and his message of the king. He wants everybody to be saved. And uh, once I was uh, I was on a date in South Africa at a farmer's market. It's very beautiful. Uh, there was live music going on. People were selling their local goods or food or things like that. You know, it's a nice, relaxed environment. And uh, I was sitting on a hill watching this live music. And there's people with their dogs. There's people with their kids. There's people with their spouses. There's people just by themselves enjoying the day. And I'm on top of this hill looking down at maybe 100 people just enjoying themselves. I'm thinking God wants every person at this farmer's market to be saved. There's not a single person that he just goes, no, not you, not you, but I'm glad Jesse's here. No, he wants everybody at that farmer's market to be saved because there's not a person on the planet that God doesn't love. Right. And it says God wants nobody to perish. Have you ever wanted someone to perish? You know, okay, we don't have to be like really mean about it. But you know what I'm saying? Like at the workplace, you have, uh, you have good old Ronnie who comes up every day. Uh, and he always annoys you or he's always moving stuff around at your desk. And you're just like, if Ronnie wasn't here in my workplace, my life would be a lot better. You know, if Ronnie get, maybe I don't want him to Paris, but if he could just move to a different state or something, <laughs> if he was somehow out of my life, it would be awesome. You know what I'm saying? Or just someone who gets on your nerves all the time, even if that's your spouse, you know, so I don't know. I'm not married. You ever wanted your spouse to Paris? You get in a fight or something? Okay. Amen. But you know what I'm saying? We get angry at people. And sometimes we are like, I wish they were just somewhere else. We get upset with them. And I don't think I've ever wanted someone to perish, per se. But if I had to think of one person that, you know, maybe I wanted them to perish, it would be the person who processed my visa to allow me to go into South Africa. <laughs> because I would do months and months of, like, questioning and, and calling the embassy, and she never helped me. It was always the same lady that answered the phone for some reason. At the embassy. And it wasn't helpful whatsoever. Months went by, months went by. I hired an immigration lawyer. All these sorts of things. And finally, I got all my paperwork together. I had to fly to New York in person. And uh, once I get to New York and I drop off all my paperwork, guess who the one person is that's oh. going to process my visa? Same the same lady that was mad at me that I'm calling all the time just so I could ask, what do I need to submit? What do I need to do? And uh, I applied for three years. I had all the paperwork signed. The church had signed it that they wanted me to come for three years. Everything was straight. And she gives me six months. And to this day, almost two years later, I'm still working through immigration and visa issues. My mom's just shaking her head like, yes, very much so. And uh, so if anyone in the world I wanted to parent, it would be her. Like, God, please, out of my life, I'd be in South Africa for three years. No immigration problems, no visa problems. But God does not want that lady to perish. God wants that lady to be my sister in Christ. God wants that lady to be in the kingdom and love the kingdom and live eternally with him forever and that's how god feels about the laws yeah that's how god feels about the law he was teaching me a lesson yes that i needed to be patient and i needed to not want anyone to perish as well and uh so take a moment to think of your workplace every person that walks down the aisles where you work god wants them to be saved every time you're out there building a house everyone that's doing it with you he wants them to be saved. God wants everyone that you interact with to be saved. And that's kind of overwhelming. Isn't it? mm -hmm. It's a little scary to think that I have a message and where God wants everybody on the planet to hear about. It. So we're going to look at God's heart for the lost, how he feels about the law. But first, I want to tell a story about how I feel about the law. I love doing crazy things. I love, uh, I don't know why, my brain thinks of weird and crazy and big things to do. And so at the beginning of the year, I was talking to uh, one of my campus students. He was in his room. He was working out. And I was thinking about, you know what, we should do like a workout challenge or something. So I looked at him. I said, you know what? I'm going to do 10,000 push-ups next month. And I haven't gone to a gym in three years. <laughs> and I don't look at it home. But I'm like, I'm going to do 10, 10,000 push-ups next month. And he looks at me and goes, but next month is February. That's literally the shortest month in the year. <laughs> at least wait till like March that's 31 days or something. I was like, that makes it even better. So I started telling people, asking people if they wanted to join. And eventually we got like, we got like 35 people in this group that were dedicated to doing 10,000 push-ups in the month of February. And that was something like 370 push-ups every single day for the month. 
And uh, I'm telling you, I have never been a part of a more active uh, group message than that 35 uh, group that was doing it together. We were texting each other every morning. Hey, I just did 50 push-ups. I just did 100 push-ups. I just did 200 push-ups. Oh, my arms are hurt. You know, we'd wake up uh, and someone was at work at four in the morning. They'd go, come on, guys. It's a great day to kill our arms and chest. We can do this. You know, motivational quotes. People were posting stuff all the time, videos of themselves doing push-ups. I would do push-ups at gas stations because uh, in South Africa, they do gas for you. They fill up the gas for you. So I'd get out and I'd be doing push-ups because I have to be very intentional about it. Yeah. But you can't just go, oh, I forgot to do my push-ups today because now you're 600 push-ups behind. So I'd be like, oh, I have five minutes. Let me do 10. Let me do 20. Let me do 50. Every morning, every evening, I'd be doing push-ups all the time. I'd be picking up a friend at his house and he'd be like, I'd be out in a minute. I'd get out of my car. I'd be sitting in his driveway. Doing push-ups. Cars passing me by. I wonder what the world I'm doing. But I'm doing push-ups. I went, uh, I went river rafting one weekend. And while everyone else was, uh, you know, sunburnt and exhausted and drying off and get changed in their new clothes, I'm sitting there stopping wet in the grass doing push-ups. <laughs> because I'm going to do 10,000 push-ups this month. But on day seven, I injured my right shoulder and I couldn't do more than 10 a day without, without, I just, without collapsing. So that went on for about seven days and I was over 2,000 push-ups behind. And I thought, Okay, that was fun. It was a fun idea. Everyone else can finish it. But then I was like, no, let me, let me actually finish this. Even though I'm 2,000 behind, I'm going to finish it. So I was doing 600, 700, 800, 900, 1,000 push-ups a day. And I finished the last day of February doing 10,001 push-ups. There you go. Take that extra in. So I know I don't look the strongest, but I did 10,001 push-ups that month. But then it, but then it convicted me. Because every morning, every evening, in crazy places, I'm doing push-ups. I'm keeping my brothers and sisters. There were sisters in there as well doing push-ups. So it's not just a guy thing. We were keeping each other accountable. People would be like, guys, I don't know if I can do this. Messages all over the place. You can do it. Just push yourself. We were keeping each other accountable. And I'm thinking, why am I doing all this work just to do push-ups? I carry within myself. The literal spirit of God himself. I have a relationship with the creator of the universe. I'm covered in the blood of the most perfect human to ever walk the face of the planet. And I spent all my energy doing push-ups. How does that make sense? There's something off here. I think if Jesus was alive today, he would not be living the way I am living. He would be living radically different. He wouldn't be spending his mornings and evenings doing push-ups. I think he'd be doing something else. And that's my heart for the law. And we know that God wants everyone to be saved. But of course he does because he's God and he's perfect and he's amazing and all that sort of stuff. And we'll never live up to who God is. But let's look at an example that's maybe a little bit more relatable. Let's look at another human being and his heart for the law. Let's look at Paul's example. Let's look at Romans Chapter nine. And uh, if there is if there's ever a scripture that is really hard for me to believe, it would be this scripture in Romans chapter nine. And uh, I remember one time we were we were driving to church uh, as, as a family. I don't know how old I was, maybe 13 or something. And for some reason, my mom and dad were talking about the scripture of uh, if you can be trusted with little, you can be trusted with more. You guys know what I'm yeah. talking about? And then I said, oh, well, I don't really know if that's true. Because in my little brain, I'm like, if you give me a little tiny task to take care of, I don't really care about it. It doesn't mean anything. But if you give me a big boy task to do, you know, something like, Jake, you got to be the man and, you know, do this big thing. I'm going to be like, you know, I'm ready. This is my time to show that I'm responsible. And so, you know, I think my, my dad sat me down and said, no, it's more about if you don't have the character to take care of a little thing, why would someone trust you with the character to take care of a big thing? That was, that was a scripture. I was like, oh, okay, I see. Yeah, I see. But if there's another scripture that's really hard for me to believe, it would be Romans 9. Now let's go there. It says in verse 1, or verse 2, actually. This is Paul speaking. He says, I have great sorrow and unceasing, unceasing anguish in my heart. For I wish, for I could wish that I myself were cursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my people, those of my own race, the people of Israel. Think about what Paul is saying here and how much he cares for his fellow Israelites. 
He says, I wish I was cut off so that somebody else could have salvation. He says, I wish I could lose my relationship with Christ so that someone else could have it. That is the length of how far Paul is willing to go for somebody else to have salvation. And you know what? Paul never even met Jesus in person. Think about how badly Paul just desires to meet Jesus one day. He's sitting there going, all I want is to meet my creator. But then he said, I'll give all that up if somebody else could be saved. And he's not exaggerating. Let's read verse one. He's not making a hyperbole here. He says, I speak the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience confirms it through the Holy Spirit. Paul really means what he's talking about. here: That he would go to the extent of losing his salvation for the sake of someone else. This is a man that loves the law. And sometimes it's hard for us to give up five minutes of our time to have a conversation with someone. Sometimes it's hard for us to give up our insecurity for the sake of reaching out to somebody. Like this, that's this big compared to Paul wanting to lose his salvation for the sake of somebody else. Let's look at another example. Let's look at Jeremiah chapter 20. Jeremiah was a prophet. He was called the lonely prophet because he was all by himself. There was no one else at that time who was preaching the message that he was preaching. That's why he wrote the book of Lamentations. He was a guy who lamented a lot. I can imagine being lonely, being the only guy preaching the message. But in verse 8, he says, whenever I speak, I cry out proclaiming violence and destruction. Because he was going around preaching like, if you don't repent, God's going to destroy you. That was the message that Jeremiah was preaching at the time. And so he says, so the word of the Lord has brought me insult and reproach all day long. But if I say I will not mention his word or speak anymore in his name, his word is in my heart like a fire. A fire shut up in my bones. I am weary of holding it in. Indeed, I cannot. To Jeremiah, the word of God was a fire shut up in his bones. He couldn't help but hold it in. It's like he was addicted to evangelism. I think a lot of us, and myself included, we're addicted to silence. Silence is the thing that burns in our bones. What's running through our hearts and minds is, ah, don't, don't speak to that. I don't know. Don't talk to him. And he's wearing headphones. He doesn't want to talk to me. Like, what does that even mean? You know what I'm saying? Like, oh, he, he's, he's too strong. He wouldn't want to talk to a guy like, oh, why do we do this? Why do, why do we have all those things running in our heart instead of I'm addicted to speaking about the words of God, even though it brings me insult and reproach and people hate me and they want to kill me. I can't help it. I just have to speak the words of God. That's somebody who loves the law. Cindy McLaughlin, in her interview, quoted Hebrews 4.16. We're going to end in Hebrews 4.16. Hebrews 4, verse 16 says, Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. We're going to take communion now, and I want you to think of the ways that you need grace and the ways that you need help when it comes to your heart towards the law. We know about God wants everybody to be saved. We know that Paul was willing to give up his salvation for the sake of people receiving God's mercy. We know that Jeremiah was addicted to evangelism. And so look at yourself and say, where do I need God's grace and help right now? We're going to approach the throne of God together as we take communion. And, uh, and I want you to think about how you can love the lost and how God can help you to love the lost. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for your word. Thank you that you love everyone enough to somehow find me. And uh, you love everyone enough to find the people that are here. God, thank you that the message of your kingdom is the greatest message that we have. I pray, God, that you can help us uh, to, to be as passionate about your message as you are. God, thank you for the grace that you give us when we fall short. Thank you that you took our place and uh, sacrificed yourself to cover, uh, cover our sins and that you remember them no more. Thank you that you allow us to access your throne for grace and for help in our time of need. And uh, God, I pray that as a Knoxville church in our time of need, I pray that we can find the help that we need to reach out to those that also need help from you, Father. We love you. We thank you and praise in your son's name. Amen.